So the big question is this, how do value-obsessed leaders ascend their business and life to world-class levels of effectiveness, even if they're inside a bureaucracy or starting from scratch with absolutely no capital? That is the question, and this podcast is going to bring you the answer. My name is Doug Utberg, and this is the Terminal Value Podcast. Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. We have Kevin Hannigan with us today, and we're going to be talking about demystifying data literacy. Uh, so Kevin is actually, uh, so he is the chief learning officer at, I'm going to make sure that I try, try to pronounce this correctly. Is it, okay, I, I can't pronounce click, the name. Click, <laughs> click, click, click with click, a Q. It's click with a Q. Click, yes. Click. Yeah. Go, yeah, yeah, exactly. I was looking at it. And I'm like, Quillick? Yeah, I know that's not right, uh, but yes, a click. And uh, so what we're going to be talking about is kind of data analytics and what that really means, uh, because at least in my observation, and you know, don't let me talk too much, and uh, you know, please introduce yourself in just a moment, but in my observation, I think there's a lot of misinformation or misunderstanding, yeah. um, you know, just about like, say, data, data science, uh, how data anal analytics work, uh, et cetera. And, um, you know, just kind of in, in my, uh, you know, just in my experience, I know that's something that, uh, you know, of course, I, you know, when I did business school, uh, we did statistics. And so I'm certainly not an expert statistician, but I have far more expertise in statistics than the average person because the average person yeah. has none. Um, and so at least one of the things that I've found is that uh, I see the practical limit of data science and data analytics, not so much in computational ability, but in ability to articulate concepts to decision makers. Um, Absolutely. And so I'm going to, I'm just going to throw that grapefruit right over the plate for you to take yeah. a swing at. So Kevin's out of Boston. So, you know, baseball's religion in Boston. Um, and uh, so, but yeah, I'm just going to throw that one right over the plate and uh, take the microphone. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. I appreciate it. Well, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, right? So there's so much data out there now. And organizations, individuals can really harness that and, and drive it for value. But when a lot of people look at that, they think about we need the data scientists, like you said, we need the computational power, we need the predictive analytics. But then you take a step back in those uh, those people who come up with those models, they're not the decision maker, right? They're handing it over to someone else. And someone else is like, what's a confidence interval? What, what's an R number? What, what do you mean? And, and, you know, worst case scenario is they take something and they act on it and then they come back and say, well, the statistician told me to do it. Yeah. The statistics doesn't mean 100%, right? It's all about probability and predictability. So you have to understand yeah. and interpret the data. And to us, that's what data literacy really is. It's about understanding the raw data, understanding the insights coming from those interpretations. But then at the same time, so much stuff is different nowadays. The mental models are different. So what yeah. I mean by that is, you know, when, when my parents were growing up and went to school, their job stayed the same. They retired doing the exact same thing. Right now, yeah. I can't last a week without changing technology, changing right. metrics. And so our brain has these shortcuts and we, we make decisions thinking, yeah, that makes sense. But it's actually based off of something that's not, no longer relevant. So, you know, long story short, to us, data literacy, data analytics, to me, it's about marrying that understanding of what are your insights, but then let's check them. Let's challenge them. Let's hypothesis test Let's make sure that we're not missing something. We yeah. don't have a bias. We don't have an assumption we didn't bring to life. Yeah. Well, and you know, yeah, at least in, in my view, I think what I really think of in uh, in terms of like say data uh, data literacy is um, well. I'm going to step back a little bit. Uh, have you ever had a chance to read the wonderful book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast yes, and Slow? Exactly. That to is to this day there. one of my yeah about you know and and uh, for people who uh, who that name doesn't ring a bell. So Daniel Kahneman and in uh, you know in concert with uh, Amos Tversky, oddly enough, out of the University of Oregon. Uh, I'm from Oregon, so I have to you know throw a shout out to my Good home enough. state. Uh, yeah, but you know uh, you know out of the University of Oregon are the people who pioneered prospect theory in the 1970s. I believe it was the late 70s, um, and so. The idea of prospect theory is that it was really the first uh, empirical codification of how human beings do not make rational decisions. And there are a number of predictable, repeatable ways in that people make predictably irrational decisions in similar ways, you know, whenever you're dealing with large groups of people and they talk, they talk about those in terms of heuristics and biases. Um, and so like, for example, uh, you, know, you know, one of these, a lot of these come down to the fact that 
at a um, kind of, uh, you would say at an emotional level, yes. human beings do not understand statistics. Um, and so like, for example, um, you know, if, if you have say a business venture that has a, you know, that has say a 60% chance of doubling your money, uh, but if it dub doesn't double your money, you'll get zero. Well, you should take that, you should make that investment a hundred times out of a hundred. Because it, it, you know, because if you have enough diversification, you will make fantastic returns. Uh, you know, however, that forty percent chance of total loss will result in a significant majority of people saying that's too risky. Yes, risk averse. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, and so, so what what ends up happening is a you know because pe I think because a lot of people have uh, just I, I would call it an evolutionary difficulty understanding statistics. There is a uh, there is a almost like an ingrained risk aversion uh, that uh, you know I think that a lot of people express, and that you know that that unfolds in uh, you know, that that unfolds in the way that you live or, you live your life that you you plan your career, and at the same time, there's also a evolutionary risk seeking, uh, which is, you know, and the risk seeking behavior is that when people perceive that they don't have better options, a lot of times what they will do is they will take extremely bad risks, like very, oh. very, very bad risks, because there's a slim chance of, of either getting even or paying off. You know, this is the, this is the proverbial gambler's dilemma, right? You know, you have somebody who's built up a whole bunch of debt gambling. And so they say, okay, well, I'm going to bet more because then when I finally win, I'll break even. <laughs> yes. Very irrational, but yes. Yes, exactly. extremely irrational. <laughs> um, so, but, but, but anyway, yeah, the, uh, um, so yeah, I, I'd love to get your thoughts. So those are some of the things at least that I've seen. Well, absolutely. And I, and I think that's one of the things we're trying to articulate with data literacy is, you know, the first step is awareness. You have to understand yeah. the brain has those heuristics and those bias because there are ways you can mitigate it by working in a diverse team, having other people challenge your assumptions um, and they're not always bad. Like you said, many times they lead to irrational decisions, but there are other yeah. heuristics that are just shortcuts that allow you to yeah. quickly process things that happened before. Again, if what happened before is not relevant today, then you miss that. So it's always about like, you know, I, I always use the analogy in school. They always have your kids, you know, show their math homework because if they get it wrong, yeah. they can show them where they made the mistake. But in business, we don't show our work. We just jump to those irrational yeah predictable decisions, we need to take a step back and kind of show our work to, to prove that this is the process. And then we can step backwards using tools to say, okay, this was a false assumption or, oh, you know what, based in science, this is not a rational decision. Yeah. But we don't do a lot of that stuff as humans, right? We just tend to jump right in and, you know, listen to our brains or listen to our gut brain, I guess, as opposed yeah. to the, the other side of it. Right. Right now, yeah, precisely. Well, and so I think the uh, the million dollar question, or I suppose with inflation, you might say the billion dollar question, <laughs> is is going to be, uh, you know, what do we, what do you do about it? How do you mitigate that, uh, you know, that kind of situation? You know, because at least, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I've observed is that, uh, you know, cognitive biases are present in everybody. Some people are more aware of them than others. But what I found is that the higher people get on a organizational structure the more they think that they are not subject to biases. <laughs> and the absolute worst situation in terms of a cognitive bias is if you think you don't have one, because then you exactly. will have a bias that you, because then you will express a bias, but think you're being objective. Yes. Uh, so a couple of things. I mean, the, the thing that I would start with at an organization level is you want to have a culture where it's okay to challenge people up that yeah. org chart because sometimes you have um, situations where there's group thinking, you're nervous of talking to your boss and saying, I don't agree with you. So the, the way that you know, I found success is when obviously you educate everyone. So those experiments that, yeah. that uh, Tversky has done and others, you, you, you prove those out in, in training sessions, you ask people to pick you know, what they think and then they, they hopefully see, wow, that's right, the brain does that, yeah. it's powerful, but then you put in processes, systematic processes, systemic processes to help challenge and check things. So if it's a very strategic decision, don't yeah. just come up with one possible scenario, come up with multiple scenarios so that your brain's not trying to confirm just one of them, it's working against both of them. Appointing devil's advocates, you know, working yeah. with the, one of the big things I'm a huge fan of, uh, it ties nicely to diversity and inclusion is, is having a, a cognitively diverse team 
because I think a certain way based off my beliefs, how I was brought up and someone else yeah. might have, it's like that old, if you ever, I'm dating myself, that old game show, classic concentration, uh -huh. there's puzzle pieces. And the more you see of it, the more it comes together. Uh -huh. We're making decisions off one small corner. Wouldn't it be great if we were able to loop other people in that was able to see the other pieces and then you put it together, mm -hmm. you actually get the holistic view. Um, but yeah. we just don't tend to do that. We tend to run with gut decisions or we tend to at organizations have the decision-making being this level and above. Yeah. Um, and part that, of that is lack of technology yeah. and stuff, but. Well, there, there was one thing you said there that I want to unpack a little bit because yeah. I think it's really, really important. And that is a cognitively diverse team. Yes. And so when you talk about a cognitively diverse team, what that means is a team where people think differently, not just look differently exactly. and because i think this is probably what i this, well i was going to say there there are many um there are many stumbling points you can pick on uh through the diversity and inclusion movement but i think the probably the one of the biggest weaknesses is that it is focused so much on ethnic identity that I think cognitive diversity has become a distant second to completely lost. And you know, just for, for everybody's education uh, who's listening, and this uh, this doesn't ring a bell. The idea is that right, you know, people you know people who look different can still think in similar patterns. Yeah. Uh, you know, I uh, you know I think a simplified example of this would be like, for example, if you look at a disc assessment, right, which is I'm probably going to screw up one of these, but you know, it's like either dominance, influence, steadiness, or conscientiousness. And so, like, for example, if you have a whole bunch of people who are, say, ethnically diverse, but are all DIs, right, you know, they're all hard charging type A, you know, you know what, you know, what, what, want to be the one in charge, there is no way that would be a productive team. Exactly. Uh, on the other hand, if you have, like, say, everybody who's like S's or C's, that will not be a productive team either, because on the one hand, you'll have everybody trying to be in charge. On the other hand, you'd have nobody trying to, you know, nobody wanted to be in charge. It's cognitive diversity is extremely important to having an effective team. And it just, it maddens me how few people really understand that. I, I couldn't agree more. And so we don't, I click, we don't use this. We use Myers-Briggs, but it's the same thing, right? Yeah, you have the MBTI profile. Yeah, it's, I happen yeah. to be an INTJ and I, I but again, yeah. same thing. If you have a bunch of type A's yeah. and it's been proven out in science, but yeah. you know, being a sports fan, it's proven out in sports too, yeah. right? The, yeah. the best yeah. athletes on a team that are not a team does not always make the best team. And then you have like the 1980 Olympic US hockey team that yeah. wasn't the best team, but they had the best cognitively diverse ethic and yeah. perspective and coach that just put them all together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, so, well, so, so, and cause I think that there's a couple of things to unpack there. Um, so, you know, number one, I can't help but take a chance to pick on the LA Lakers because, you know, since I'm in Portland, I'm a trailblazers fan and, and I'm you know, a Celtics but, fan. So yes. yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. So, so yeah. So there's, there's like literally nobody on this call who has any love for the Los Angeles yeah. Lakers. Um, but, you know, they have a ridiculously high payroll team, right? They have, I think four of their five starters are all future hall of famers yeah. and they're like, you know, 15 games under 500. They're atrocious. Exactly. They might not even make the playing game or they'll make the playing game, but that's it. Yeah. And it's the, yeah. right. They're not the equivalent of cognitively diverse. They all want to have the ball. Maybe they don't all yeah. want to pass. They want to shoot. Um, that's, that's exactly what we're talking about in the business setting is you need role players, right? You can't have all the same stars and they yeah. all to your point need to think about perspectives differently because that's how you remove that classic concentration puzzle and see it from a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, and so, uh, okay. So now let's, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've polished the problem very well. Let, let's cross the bridge to what do we do about it? Cause you know, let's say that we have somebody who's listening who's saying, okay, I see that at my company. How do I fix it? Absolutely. Well, it's a, it's a hard question to answer at a high level in terms of there's, there's key strategies, but every company is different. And what I mean by that yeah. is I think you have to fix the culture. Right. If the yeah. culture is not supportive of allowing you to be in a meeting and have people below a certain level make decisions, um, you got to fix that first. Some organizations already yeah. have that. I'm also a big fan of, of showing a quick win, showing a win, proving out the value. Because there are, like you're, you said, there are going to be some people like, this is voodoo magic. We don't buy it. I don't get it. Yeah. Whatever. My guts never failed me in 50 years. It's not going to fail me you show the value of using a diverse team, using a, method, a methodology, a process, a framework. Um, and to me, it's also all about the right tools and technologies, yeah. right? Because, you know, we talk about art, um, we talk about active intelligence is one of the words we use is 
you're combining the technology to bring the right data and the right informed actions, but you're balancing it with your critical thinking skills and your assumptions yeah. and your storytelling, and you need both of them. Um, so it's definitely about the culture, it's about the technology, but then for me, being the chief learning officer, it's making sure it's almost like back to school. It's you need to learn about yeah. active listening. You need to learn about challenging assumptions, mitigating bias. Yeah. Um, you know, my big one I'm talking about now a lot is, is questioning. We don't question yeah. a lot of things. We just treat them because you see on the news, you see everywhere, there's a lot of disinformation out there. And so you can uh -huh. use simple checklist. Is it a trusted source? No, but the problem in business is they're trusted sources. They don't know they're giving you misinformation. Yeah. And so you just blindly treat it as true. You have that kind of confirmation bias and yeah. you've got to educate people to think critically. Yeah, well, I mean, and, you know, I think news is a classic example, right? You know, you can have Fox and CNN report the exact same facts and they'll report them Absolutely in completely different, different ways. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so, but, uh, but yeah, I kind of, uh, I, I want to, you know, I uh, want to dive a little deeper in what you just said, because I think it's, uh, I think it's actually really important uh, because the uh, the idea that's coming to my mind is I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read uh, Ray Dalio's book Principles. Yes. Um, so, but kind of principles comes to mind to at least to me in you know kind of a, uh, a sort of a handbook for what you're talking about. And for people who haven't had a chance to, uh, number one, go read Principles if you have. Uh, if, if I'm pr I'm sure you can get a free PDF if uh, you know if your budget constrained. Otherwise, it's just a few dollars on Amazon. But basically, it's about the way that Ray Dalio structured the uh you know kind of structured the management and uh you know kind of and, and people team at bridgewater uh you know which is the world's largest head, hedge fund but the whole idea is that uh you know is that when it comes to when it comes to presenting ideas that the strength of the idea is what matters not the person who's presenting it um and so that anytime that you're debating an idea that the person's rank in the company should have no significance and you know, and then I think that the other thing that at least that I thought was uh, was interesting. Now this is a um, this is a rather extreme example of transparency, but I still think it's illustrative, which is where they record all of their meetings and have them available for you know for, for anybody for anybody to be able to hear. Uh, so you know, basically the idea of complete and total transparency, because you know at you know if you put something like that in place. I think it'd be scary at the first, nobody would say anything, but eventually you just get to where, okay, well, you know, if you're, if you're going to say something, you have to be able to back it up. And then people have, you, you have to have to be able to have a, uh, you know, a cross comparison and just start getting okay with that. I mean, like you said, it's a transition, right? In the beginning, yeah. if the culture doesn't support that, people are not going to talk because they fear they're going to be retaliated or yes. I don't think I'm stupid or what if I'm just saying what if and I hurt someone's feelings. But then once the culture embraces it and people are like, yeah. it's okay to have those feelings, like let's talk them out. It, it revolutionizes decision making. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, precisely. I mean, and uh, well, like, and I think a um, another way that I think uh, might be is potentially effective to look at that is so I, I just recently uh, reread the uh, Six Hats Thinking Method. Uh, the author's yes. name is escaping me right now, but you know, the, the whole idea is that you know, saying okay, if the, if you think about things from say six distinctly different yeah. methods, yeah. and you, what you do is you tell people, you say okay. You know, say, you know, if we're talking about like, say, you know, the blue hat is where you just talk about process. We say, okay, we're in blue hat mode. We're just talking about the process we're going through. I want you to think in that method. And then white hat is facts. Okay, we're only talking about relevant facts. And then, you know, then red hat. And I actually thought this was a, I thought this would, you know, this one kind of, you know, I nearly tripped on my, you know, because I think I was out walking when I was listening to it. I nearly tripped. Is the idea of the red hat from the six hats thinking method is you get emotional responses with yeah. no expectation of people to have to explain themselves. It's just tell me how you feel. I don't want or need you to tell me why. And I think that just get it out there, document it, and then move forward, right? No, there will be no, you know, no retaliation, no explanation. You just tell me how something makes you feel and you don't have to justify it. Absolutely. And the beauty of that too, is you put people in a role they're not typically in. So yeah. they're not using their innate predestined gut feel, yeah. right? They have to think a little bit more about it. So, you know, I enjoy playing the red hat once in a while because typically yeah. I'm not or other ones, but that that's the benefit is you try to typecast people the opposite of the way they really are yeah. to having to think about the process. 
Yeah, and well, it's, you know, and so like, for example, right, you know, everybody has an area where they naturally default. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a person of contradiction, because the majority of my career was in finance, you know, which is a pretty, mm -hmm. you know, kind of linear, logical, a, a, if A and B, then C, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, but the way my mind uh, works is very much in terms of, you know, kind of creative thinking, new possibilities. Well, what if we did, act, you know, what, what if we figured out a different way to reconfigure things? Is there, you know, is there some sort of new way to solve the problem? Um, you know, and of course that, uh, you know, that type of thing, you know, stood in contrast with the, um, you know, with the kind of linear anal retentive uh, way that finance Absolutely. is normally done. Yes. You're talking um, exponential as opposed to linear. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, but, the, but you need both. You need yeah. you, you you need both. You know if you know if you get all exponentials, nothing will ever get done. Correct. And if you get all linears, nothing will ever get done better. Yes, that's a good way to put it, actually. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and, and I just just came up with that off the top of my head, but I might have to <laughs> write it down. I'll have to I'll put that on a quote gram and then uh, yes. throw it up on Twitter. <laughs> Um, so, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, and so I think the the good part is, you know, kind of the silver lining here is there are tools that are out there to really help with this process. But I think for anybody listening to this, who are really, who's really looking to, you know, kind of to implement this in their business, it's really, you know, go out and find the tools for kind of, you know, for, um, you know, for implementing thinking that is, uh, you know, that is less connected to the person. I mean, because I think, at least to me, what it's really about is getting your thinking processes not connected, you know, disconnected from the people. Because right. anytime that, you're, that your thinking process is connected to the person, it will naturally default to whoever has the most authority. Correct. Right. Or who happens to be the one who's outgoing versus an introvert yeah. who doesn't want to speak yes. or whatever. Correct. 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 Yes. And well, and, and then, you know, and of course, I think that's, you know, I know that that, that was one of the things that especially as, um, you know, as, you know, when, you know, as I was managing teams, one of the things that I, I probably, I know I didn't do as good a job as I should have, but that I was, I thought of quite a bit because, you know, there were a number of people who worked on my team uh, who are from Southeast Asia, who, mm -hmm. you know, in their case, all of them were quite introverted, culturally tend to be quite introverted, but they were all really smart. And I'm like, yeah. okay, well, I have to make sure they don't get bowled over because A, it's not fair. And B, I don't want their good ideas to just stay inside their head. Exactly. It's not good for attention, yeah. but then it's also, you don't get the good idea, right? The yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. A, a good idea that somebody is afraid to express is, is no idea. Exactly. So, so, all right. Well, um, well, let's see. So I think we're, we're getting a little close to time here, but uh, um, give us one or two more uh, kind of one or two more nuggets of wisdom and then let everybody know where they can find out more on uh, your website, social handles, uh, anything you'd like to share. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. So um, I mean, good news is I, I just launched a book called Turning Data into Wisdom, which is actually right around this. It's about decision making okay. process and all of the authors you mentioned are, are referenced in the book in certain chapters, um, as well as other tools as well. But I think for people listening to this, it's just, it's about realizing, summarizing what you said, everyone has bias and that yeah. impacts us in the business world because there's better decisions out there that we can make if we take a step back and say, we have bias, we have assumptions, we need to democratize data, we need to democratize insights and decisions. Yeah. And there are tools and processes out there that will help you do this in a, in a, um, you know, realistic manner to, to walk raw, to, to walk before you run. And you're going to see tremendous rewards on it. We see organizations all the time going from gut feel to informed actions and yeah. um, tripling what they're working on. So, you know, I encourage everyone to listen yeah. to the book, listen to whatever, any of the authors you had mentioned to, um, you know, learn more about it. Uh, okay. So give us the title of the book one more time. Yep, it's called Turning Data into Wisdom. You can get it on Amazon. You could just type in my last name, H-A-N-E-G-N. It's Thank you for listening to the Terminal Value Podcast. Please feel free to visit me online at www.terminalvalue.biz where you can subscribe, find me on social, and then we can connect and just keep the conversation going. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and I hope you have a wonderful day. All rights reserved. No part of this broadcast may be produced in any form by any means without written permission from Business of Life, LLC. All trademarks and brands referred to herein are the property of their respective owners.